Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to our living room. Um, I was going to film in the garage, but it's getting a little chilly, chillier. Now, granted, I'm Canadian, and I guess it were just okay to be in minus 50 temperature and and say la vie. But uh, yeah, so, um, but uh, my, my family was like, Dad, you could totally film again in the in the in the kitchen so I was like oh right on so here we are um I got my poofy hair I don't know what's going on with that um my hair is now uh going vertical but uh pray for it all right um we are going to continue on with our book you know anxious for nothing if I am calm in a chaotic world by Max Licato earlier on this morning we were talking about uh, to clinging to Christ. So I'm going to just uh, pick up where we left off. He says, our aim, I'm going to read a little bit from what we left off. He goes, our aim, our only aim is to be at home in Christ. He is not a roadside park or a hotel room. He is our permanent mailing address. Christ is our home. He is our place of refuge and security. We are comfortable in his presence, free to be our authentic selves. We know our, our way around in our home. We know his heart and his ways. We rest in him and find our nourishment in him. And his, his roof of grace protects us from the storms of guilt. His walls of providence secure us from our, the destructive winds. His fireplace warms us during the lonely winters of life, and we linger in the abode of Christ and never leave. The branch never releases the vine, ever. Does a branch show up on Sunday for its once-a-week meal? Only at the risk of death. The healthy branch never releases the vine because there it receives nutrients 24 hours a day. If branches had seminars, the topic would be the secrets of vine grabbing. But branches don't have seminars because to attend them, they would have to release the vine, something that they refuse to do. The dominant duty of the branch is to cling to the vine. The dominant duty of the disciple is the same. We Christians tend to miss this we banter about pledges to change the world, uh, make a difference for Christ, and lead people to the Lord. Yet these are all byproducts of the Christ-focused life. Our goal is not to bear fruit. Our goal is to stay attached. Maybe this image will help. When a father leads his four-year-old son down a crowded street, he takes him by the hand and says, Hold on to me. He doesn't say, memorize the map, take your chances dodging the traffic, or let's see if you could find your way home. No, the good father gives the child one responsibility. Hold on to my hand. God does the same with us. You know, don't load yourself down with lists. You know, don't enhance your anxiety with the fear of not fulfilling them. Your goal is not to know every detail of the future. Your goal is to hold the hand of the one who does not and never lets go. So this was the choice of this guy named Kent Brantley. Brantley was a medical missionary in Liberia, waging a war on the most cruelest of viruses, Ebola. The epidemic was killing people, if you remember, by the thousands. As much as any person in the world, Brantley knew the consequences of this disease. He had treated dozens of cases, and he knew the symptoms. Soaring fever, severe diarrhea, and nausea. He had seen the result of the virus, and for the first time, he was feeling the symptoms himself. His colleagues had drawn blood and began tests, but it would, wouldn't be for three days before they knew the results. On Wednesday evening, July 23rd, 2014, Dr. Brantley quarantined himself in his house and he waited. 
His wife and family were across the ocean. He, his co-workers could not enter his residence. He was quite literally alone with his thoughts. Sound familiar? He opened his Bible and meditated on a passage from the book of Hebrews. Then he wrote in his journal, The promise of entering his rest still stands. So let us never give up. Let us therefore make every effort to enter his rest. Dr. Brantley considered the phrase, make every effort. He knew he would have to do exactly that. He then turned his attention to one another verse of the same chapter in Hebrews. Let us then approach the throne room, the throne of grace with confidence, so that when we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He copied the scripture into his prayer journal and wrote the words with confidence in italics. He closed his journal and he began to wait. The three days brought unspeakable discomfort. The test result confirmed what they had feared, that he had contracted Ebola. Kent's wife, Amber, was in her hometown of Abilene, Texas. And when he called her with a diagnosis of the following Saturday afternoon, she and her two children were visiting her parents. When her, when her phone rang, she hurried to the bedroom for some privacy. Kent went straight to the point. The results came back as positive. She began to cry. They talked for a few moments before Kent said what that he was tired and would he try to call again soon. Now it was Amber's turn to process this news. She and her parents sat on the edge of her bed and wept for several minutes. After some time, Amber excused herself and went outside. She walked across a field toward a large mesquite tent, mesquite tree and took a, uh, a seat on the low-hanging branch. She found it difficult to find words to formulate her prayers. She, she used the lyrics of hymns she had learned as a young girl. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not as thou hast been, thou forever will be. The words lifted her spirits, and she began to sing aloud another song that she treasured. I need thee every hour, in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is in vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. She later wrote, I thought my husband was going to die. I was in pain. I was afraid. Though Those hymns, though, I was able to connect with God in a meaningful way when I couldn't find my own words to pray. Kent was transported from Africa to Atlanta. His caregivers chose to risk an untested treatment. Little by little, his condition improved. Within a few days, his strength began to return. The entire world, it seemed, rejoiced when he was able to exit the hospital, cured of, of, of Ebola. We can applaud the Brantley's victory over another disease, a virus that is every bit uh, as deadly and contagious, the unseen contagion of anxiety. Kent and Amber were prime candidates of panic, yet they reacted the same resolve that enabled them to battle Ebola. They stayed connected to the vine. They resolved to abide in Christ. Kent opened up his Bible and Amber meditated on hymns. They filled their minds with the truth of God. Jesus taught us to do the same. He tells us rather bluntly, do not worry about your life because it has enough worry for its own. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. He then gives these two amazing commands. Look and consider. He tells us to look at the birds of the air. 
And when we do, we notice how happy they seem to be. They aren't frowning or cranky or grumpy. They don't appear sleep deprived or lonely. They sing, whistle, and soar. Yet they never sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They don't drive tractors or harvest wheat. Yet Jesus asks us, do they appear well cared for? He then turns our attention to the flowers of the field. Consider the lilies. By the same token, they don't do anything. Even though their lifespan is short, God dresses them up for a red carpet appearance. Even Solomon, the richest king in history, was not arrayed like one of these. So how do we disarm anxiety? Stockpile our minds with God thoughts. Let me just repeat that one more time. How do we disarm anxiety? Because anxiety will be there. So Max says this, he says, stockpile, build up in mass quantities, God thoughts. Draw the logical implication. If birds and flowers fall under the categories of God's care, won't he care for us as well? Saturate your heart with the goodness of God. Set your minds on things above, not on the things of earth. Colossians 3, 2. How might you do this? A friend recently described to me her daily 90-minute commute. That's right, 90 minutes. Don't feel sorry for me, she said. I use the trip to think about God. She went on to describe how she fills the hour and a half with worship and sermons. She listens to entire books of the Bible. She recites prayers. And by the time she reaches her place of employment, she is ready for the day. I turn my commute into my chapel. Do something similar. Is there a block of time that you can claim for God? Perhaps you can turn off the network news and open your Bible. Set an alarm 15 minutes earlier. Or rather than watch the TV comedian as you fall asleep, listen to an audio version of the Christian book. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Free from fear. Free from dread. And yes, free from anxiety. I love that, um, yeah, I just really love that stockpiling the God thoughts. And like I mentioned before, the devil operates so much, like the battlefield is so much in your mind. Um, and how we give strongholds or we give uh, an ability for the enemy to speak and give him a place to speak into our minds. And almost, well, almost 100 100% of the time when he speaks, it's usually done in half-truths or just blatant lies. But we spend too much of our time being worried and anxious about all those things. Crystal and I were uh, walking up near the Port Hills on Summit Road. Um, and there was a spot where we kind of hiked up towards a telecommunications tower. And right off that kind of summit, if you look down to the right, you saw an amazing view of Christchurch and where, where, where we live near the Charlesworth Reserve. And then on the, uh, if you just look over your left shoulder, there was the Littleton um, Harbor, like the shipping harbor. And I was seeing a large cargo ship come in and the tugboats were pushing it into, into Moorage. And at that moment, I'm just, I was just taking the time to pause. I, you know, I didn't take 15 minutes. I didn't, I didn't have to, you know, grab my Bible. In just a moment there, I watched a swallow kind of just zoom past me. We, in Canada, we have tons of barn swallows and they're just, they're everywhere. But in this moment, I just saw this one swallow and moving almost in lightning speed and that verse came to mind. God said, I'm taking care of this little bird up on top of this mountain. How much am I then taking care of you and your family? 
and I had to look and and I saw the shipping yard and I'm like, that's where our container came from Canada. This is where it had come and our container was there and then it got transported into, into town. God is taking care of all the little details and he's also taking care of all the big details. And there are so many times where I could have easily chewed my fingernails right down to the nubs. Like I was so anxious, so f trepidation, so fearful of what, what should or could or would happen. And all the what ifs, what if this doesn't happen? What if this happened? And then I was reminded of God's faithfulness. And I love that, that, uh, the Brantley woman, she, she thought about those hymns. So the question comes to us is, what is it that we need to do to cling to Christ? For some of us, it's singing those old hymns or worship songs. For some, it's opening up the Bible and sometimes playing the Bible roulette and just opening it up where it is and reading what you see. Maybe it's like I just did right before this call, this devotion is, I spent half an hour to talk to one of my new friends that helped he and his family helped me when I first came here um, to New Zealand. And so I got to chat with him. And he's a great guy where I don't have to be on with him. He's a, just a friend. And he's a, when you have friends that know you and they know your story, they can help you articulate, almost recalibrate where you are in your relationship with God. They can help you remain and to abide in Christ because that's always the picture that we need to remember the, the branch is never disconnected from the vine we're always needing to be connected God bless you as you as you think about those things as you ponder take some moments even now as, as you finish watching this just take 90 seconds and just thank Jesus for the things that you already have. Remember in our previous chapter, don't focus on the stuff that, you know, if only I have this. Turn, turn your if onlys to alreadys. What do you already have and what are you thankful for? And that creates an amazing environment for prayer. God, God bless you. We're praying for you. We believe God's that his hand is over you, protecting you, healing you, giving you a good and safe and solid sleep tonight. We pray for all your children and your grandchildren. May they sleep sound in Jesus. All right, God bless you. We'll see you again as we continue on here with these devotions tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. God bless you. We'll see you then.